Welcome to uh, our panel on uh, taking 5G networks or uh, taking networks to 5G and densifying the, uh, the networks. I'm really pleased to have with me uh, a number of really distinguished experts here uh, on that. Uh, right next to me, I have Aparna uh, Koyekar from Verizon. She's uh, VP of the South area. Uh, next to her is Barry Asmi from Teleworld Solutions. Uh, we have uh, Tormod there uh, from uh, Extanet. He's the VP CTO there. And uh, we have Ronnie Haraldsvik from Kuda Cloud. And maybe I'll turn it over to Aparna and you all introduce yourself briefly before we uh, get started with some of the conversations. Sure, sure, absolutely. And you did a good job, except you butchered my name a little bit. Hello, so Aparna Kurjekar, uh, I'm the South Area Network Lead for Verizon Wireless, and I manage uh, all the deployments and uh, the operationalization of the network for the wireless. So really focused on LTE, the optimization of LTE, uh, and now moving into the 5G world fairly quickly. Barry? Hi, uh, my name is Barry Asmi. I work for Teleworld Solutions. My background has been in software development, network optimization, deployment of wireless networks. Um, and I'm very happy, actually, I got an opportunity to talk about the small cells today. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tormod Larsen. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Exynet Systems. Exynet Systems is the largest independent uh, owner operator of distributed networks. Um, we've been in business since 2002, uh, deploying you know, DAS, small cells, um, you know, CRAN type solutions, and obviously densification is uh, right up our alley, so I'm looking forward to this uh, uh, panel. And um, my name is Ronnie Haraldsvik, 25 years in networking, the last uh, 18 in wireless, last six, seven, actually seven or eight in small cells with various companies, and the last couple of years now with, you know, related to managed services and cloud. Uh, when it comes to pushing out service into the enterprise. Uh, the company I'm with is Coda Cloud, which actually is a company in the name transition. The new name is Coda Cloud. The other name, I'm not gonna even tell you. So we'll leave it at that. All right, great. Well, let's start, and, and maybe our partner will start with you. Um, with the increase in demand in data, what, are, what is a carrier like Verizon doing to, uh, to keep up with that? Yeah, so um, I spend majority of my time thinking about that and solving for that. Uh, capacity and densification is really the new mantra right now. Over the last decade, we've seen a 4,000x increase in data and data usage. And year over year, you're seeing high single-digit growth. It, and it's relentless, it's insatiable, and we like that. It's a very exciting time right now to be in the industry. And um, really, we've got a lot of tools within the toolkit. Even in year four of our LTE deployment, there's tons that we are doing through optimization. Um, you start off with the tried and tested, of course, the macros and making sure that you're using all that spectrum that you have, and then apply carrier aggregation, apply MIMO techniques, and we're very seeing some very good results of MIMOs both on the transmit and the receive side, the four-way. Four um, but that only does so much as far as taking on capacity. We're starting to move heavily into buildings, and there are lots of solutions there coming from femtos, spider clouds, densification inside with the right kinds of DASs. And the real cool stuff's really, and which I'm hoping we'll spend some time on today, is really happening on the street. Uh, what Verizon's really professing is the low and tight philosophy, where we're going really low and very close to where the demand is. And the way to do that is through small cells. And those could be DASs, uh, ODASs, and we've got lots of partners uh, here uh, that support us on that. Uh, those could be micro cells. It could be RRHs uh, that are then dark fibered back to our CRAN hubs. So just a lot happening overall as far as the densification is concerned. Great. And Barry, you, you spend a lot of time on, on small cells. Uh, what are the most significant challenges around small cell deployment? I think uh, our partner did a very good job in identifying the indoor and outdoor scenarios for the small cell uh, uh, densification process. Uh, if you look at the small cells, you have to look at the whole spectrum of the small cell deployment. So you have to look at it from where you're going to put the antenna, how you're going to get it back to the core. 
and you have to bring in each of these steps, there are challenges. So looking at a, a small cell, it takes about 18 to 24 months to deploy a small cell. Finding locations for a small cell is a challenge. Once you address that challenge, which by itself is a, it requires a change in the way the carrier are acquiring cell sites. It requires change in terms of how they're leasing fibers. Um, also, once we acquire the location, then we are gonna look at the size of the antennas. We have to make decisions. Do we wanna do a CRAN, a VRAN? How we are gonna connect these antennas back there? And then we are looking at the SIPRI link, uh, which I believe is a little bit inefficient in terms of its data, amount of data that is uh, transport. So we have to figure out the transport mechanism, how we are gonna get the SIPRI links connected. And then we have to look at it, how we are gonna protect these, if we are using fiber, how we are gonna protect these fiber rigs. What type of technology we are gonna use for uh, uh, delivering the SIPRI links to every cell site. And I think there will be a lot of evolution in that space how to address this one that you can create a more efficient link between your small cell and uh, front hall, basically. That is the part of front hall. So that you can realize why you did a small cell. Because it is, a small cell is designed for the future. So if you miss this one and you can't do 5G with it, then you have to spend again money on that one to do that again. So once the transport mechanism is realized what needs to get done, and there are solutions right now in, in place that it's gonna do that, but it is gonna get, uh, I think there is more space for innovation and there are people are doing custom-made solutions and some are using existing solutions. Then we are gonna look at the, the backhaul of the network. So the current trend is, you know, get the small cell sites and connect them back to the macro site. And also there are some uh, thought process in terms of uh, uh, CRAN. Uh, I think the biggest challenge here will be to realize the benefit of a small cell in terms of a space, power, cost, maintenance, and everything else will be virtualized RAN. So that's where you're gonna get resource allocation uh, for your small cells there. So these are, in, in also, now we are gonna be looking at a some type of head that uh, type of scenario, and we have to look at the core back again. And just with this problem, then we have to think about the monitoring of the system, how you're gonna manage the system, how you're gonna look at the uh, uh, protection, and, uh, and obviously, SON will play a big role in that space as well. Great. And Tomo, do you have spent a lot of time on distributed uh, uh, networks? Uh, and spend a lot of time on that. And I think they're kind of like the, the brother or sister of the small cells to a certain degree. What have you seen in the development of, of distributed networks of DASs? Yeah, so may maybe I'll start with kind of what we define as distributed networks, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, for us, it's not as much of it's DAS, small cells, CRAN, even Wi-Fi. You know, you start looking at what's even happening now with you know, 3.5 and some of the things that are happening. Um, and we even look at it from a, like we mentioned, the core perspective. Um, all of these different type of architectures is for us a distributed network architecture. And you know, people talk about 5G, and you know, we were joking here to Norwegians a little bit about what is 5G, right? And 5G for us is a, much more about network architecture and changing from a voice-centric architecture that we've been living with to a data-centric architecture. And that's what we've seen as a business. You know, we started in 2002. We were deploying DAS networks in high-end residential areas. It was a coverage solution. So that was kind of step one. It's how do we go in and fill those gaps where we couldn't get there with traditional means that of being a tower and, and whatever. And those were typically DAS because that was the technology that was available at the time. Then we quickly went into you know, capacity-oriented deployments. Um, call that, you know, 07, 08, and, and, and forward. Um, and that was obviously driven by smart devices and, and, and smartphones like we knew them at that point. Um, and at that point time, we started doing a little bit of early CRAN. We did, you know, 
remote Radiohead, Outthread, and DAS nodes. We still do NAS. Um, and then that have evolved, and we're doing you know, uh, small cells, our networks, and, and Wi-Fi um, as well. But you know, again, the underlying, um, and you know, so that was a, <laughs> the, the, the capacity kind of wave. What we see now for you know, 5G is how do we build smarter networks? You know, it's not only that the devices are smart, we need to have smarter networks, specifically mm -hmm. as we start supporting also not only human interacting with a network, but also you know, uh, internet of things. Um, so you need to start building more of that into the network. And if you look at you know, a lot of the aspirations for 5G in terms of increasing the capacity, reducing the latency, um, a lot more connected devices, you, know, you need to look at a different architecture where more of the functionality of the network is pushed and distributed to the edge of the network, including some of the stuff that you see traditionally being in the core. And that's what we do. And you know, what's interesting in kind of if we look at the title here is a lot of the fundamentals are the same. You, know, you need a location to put, you call it a small cell, DAS node, AP, radio node, whatever you call it. You need connectivity to it. Mm -hmm. And you need connectivity that's, that's scalable. And you, know, you talked about with 4,000 times or whatever crazy number. You know, it needs to be something that is not just incremental. It needs to really be a big pipe. And traditionally, so far, that's been dark fiber. Um, there's also other reasons that that makes sense when you look at you know, comp and some of those things that are in the LTE advanced um, um, standards to reduce or improve the, the performance. And then um, you also need a place where you aggregate that or you hand it off to the rest of the network. So, we very much look at it from an architecture perspective, becoming almost like networks within networks. A building have a little bit different needs than the outdoor environment. A hospital have a different than a, than a, than a stadium. And in the rural market, it's certainly different than in New York. So when you deploy a 5G network in rural Idaho, you use different tools than you would do in New York City. And that's what, you know, for us, 5G is more about how do you leverage these tools and these architectures that, you know, for us is distributed network architectures. Great. And by the way, we want to make this a very interactive session. So after I, uh, I ask Ronnie a question, I would like to open it up to the audience. And so think about what you want to ask our experts here uh, on, on the stage. So Ronnie, your company does a lot with, also with the cloud. And a lot of the emphasis on 5G is especially around the enterprise. How can, can, can carriers do a better job with integrating that all and densifying the network? As I'm looking over at Verizon here, you know, be careful <laughs> what I say. <laughs> uh, I actually want to start with what, you know, Tormut kind of ended with, you know, which is sort of the, the kind of definition of 5G and how this all plays in together. You know, it's all about you know solving problems for the customer. In this case, you know, we're very keen on the enterprise. Um, it's not about you know, and the industry very often get caught up in these battles of you know, you know, Pico cell is better and DAS is better than small cell. They're better than Wi-Fi. You know, the simple answer, and this is why I find Tormut to be so pragmatic about it, is it's all of the above. It's just making it all work. You know, having a common infrastructure, and you know, having a, an assured quality of service experience that you can have in these networks. So I think the promise of 5G. You know, really has to do with a you know, certain amount of service level and experience that you're going to have, which starts in a building. It then becomes two buildings. It becomes, it may be even a neighborhood. And that's how 5G ends up being rolled out. It's not blanket coverage. We have the best 5G coverage ne network in all of North America with 350 pops. It's not going to start like that. It's going to start 5G, you know, 1,000, 5,000, and so forth. Um, the cloud just has to do with a simpler, better way of deploying services into, especially in enterprise, with less emphasis on the endpoint, the less emphasis on the hardware, and frankly, even simplifying that. We are all being push or pushed as being in the industry to develop cheaper, faster hardware that are easily deployed, and frankly, rather than replacing it, you know, we just ship you a new one, you know, whether it's a Wi-Fi access point or a small cell, because you get the price points out to be so low, and therefore, the differentiation lies you know, in the cloud managed services that you deliver either directly to the enterprise as a service provider or through an intermediary like you know, Extranet and others. So you know, the, the cloud, you know, uh, it's a very easily used and overused and misused term. 
Um, cloud used to, made something different when I worked at Bay Networks 25 years ago. Um, cloud meant something different also at SpiderCloud. You know, now the cloud is sort of that common reference point for, you know, we've got everything in the data center somewhere else and we don't know where it is, but, you know, we have the ability to, at the endpoint, find that you are a device user that have certain parameters, that have maybe a certain type of QoS, and we're going to push the service out to you, or we're just going to make sure that the small cell works or the you know, Wi-Fi access point works, and we'll tell you when it's not working. And that's, I think, where the, the promise of the service provider lies, which is, making it simpler to get to revenue for the partners, making it simpler to do the business as an enterprise. Great. Well, I want to open it up to the audience, and yes, sir. There comes the mic. One question about small cell is that uh, right now, people believe small cell is the solution for higher capacity. However, we know that small cell cannot handle high mobility so my question is, how do you address the problem with high mobility, such as a bullet train? If I want a high capacity in a bullet train, what's the best solution for satisfy that? High capacity for what? Bullet train, 500 um, kilometer per hour. High mobility. A real high mobility. Yeah. Very high mobility situation. And I want a high capacity as well. Okay. <laughs> I, I could take a stab at it if you want. Sure. Um, the reason I'm doing that, I, we're doing a lot of um, train systems, one of them is actually Chicago Transit Authority, we work with all the carriers. In that type of a, um, environment, to your point, you have mobility, um, but the good news, if it's underground, you don't have as much interference. Um, so you, there were maybe a DAS or a CRAN type solution, it's much more um, applicable because you know that the train is moving and you have the capacity that's moving through the you know, other tra tra train line or the tunnel, it's not like you have, you know, where small cells is really good, where you have, you know, in this particular area, a more of a, like to your point, a static need. So, you know, DAS or a uh, CRAN type solution will work better there. Um, in a lot of cases, DAS might make sense because um, you're able to simulcast and create these long, narrow uh, sectors. Um, but it depends on, again, the topography and the various type of technologies you want to uh, layer in. Um, and again, trade-off between economics and, and, and technical performance. Okay. So, and and I, would, I would second that. If capacity uh, allows you to do it, simulcasting, even with a CRAN-like architecture where you've got radio heads connected back to a hub, uh, work out pretty well in high mobility scenarios. Yeah. The trouble is when you simulcast, effectively your cell radio is much larger. That completely defeats the purpose of a small cell. It's not a small cell anymore. If you have a many, many base stations really simulcast the same signal, effectively you have a that, huge footprint. That is the reason why I said <laughs> if capacity allows you to do that. Well, the question is how do we address high vehicle speed and high capacity, you, you expand the cell radio, you are not addressing high capacity, you are effectively using a big cell. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it depends, right? If you're on a train, that train gotta move, and you're not gonna need capa this high capacity on 100% of the distance of that train rail, or the rail line, right? So it depends, to your point, where do you have capacity needs, or where do you not have, and it could even be a hybrid, right? It could be that, you have station areas where small cell make a whole lot of sense because people will not move as fast. And then, you know, where you are at, uh, where maybe the highest speed and, and, and the, actually the, the capacity and the users are passing, you know, that's where you have a benefit of having a, a, a narrow, long sector because you will not use it all the time. And I agree with you, you know, the CRAN has a lot of benefits because of the, the ability from a sound perspective managing that mobility much more efficiently than traditional small cells. So I don't envy your challenge, because realistically speaking, if you're talking about a train line of you know, 500 miles, and you want to go you know, up to 500, you know, uh, well, have high speed, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily sure if the small cell is the solution, unless it's actually infill at train stations and so forth. I mean, there's a reason why I'm using satellite for planes and so forth. 
Um, we rem I remember doing terrestrial training, I mean, testing into you know, the belly of the airplane back in 2001, 2002, and you're not gonna get the speeds that you get down on the ground. So maybe the answer is not small cells for the long haul, but small cells for the short haul. It, it also just, from a design perspective, if you look at the small cell in the macro with the C run, and that's all along we are trying to say here is that it is almost like an underlay overlay type of scenario. And there's interference mitigation and LTE that avoid, it actually sells to the, uh, tells to the U which one to talk to, even on the same frequency. Yeah, and you know of COMP and EICIC, yeah, those are the kinds yeah, of techniques um, that you would use yeah. um, to mitigate that. Yes. All right, and do you, do we have another question? The lady in the back? Thank you. Maybe more 4G focused, but where Aparna, you were talking about the capacity demand that we're trying to meet. And then the gentleman next to you was talking about the two years that it's taking to do small cells. Um, is that fast enough? I think that's my question. And then also I would just add to the conversation earlier that I think the term small cell maybe has many, many meanings to your, to your point. The, the remote radio heads, maybe not their traditional form factor, how that can play into the solution. So I'll take the second one first, if, if, if I may. It's so small cells, and we grapple with this internally within Verizon and across the industry. The definition of small cell can vary from a microcell, a picocell, an RRH connected back to a CRAN or a DAS. So all of these, all of the above is small cell. So uh, you're right. Uh, we can be solving for any and all of those with the small cell constructs that we're talking about. And to your point on, is 24 months fast enough? Absolutely not. Um, and we know that we're talking about thousands of small cells across the different carriers, across the US. I mean, when you're starting to talk about hundreds of feet, you can only imagine what the numbers of nodes you're gonna require. And if you're waiting for 24 months, best case, uh, in many situations to go solve for one of them, and if you go solve for each one of them independently, we're facing a battle, I and mean, we're entering a battle with a, with a sword when you need sort of big cannonballs, right? It's just not gonna work. So what we really need is um, everyone to be doing their bit. And um, honestly, CTI has been a really good partner. FCC's helped with just recently making some very good statements around how the cities and the states need to be working with us. But what's required is at that local level, we need jurisdictions to start accepting that we have to pull together a story for small cells, which is sustainable from a cost perspective. It's scalable and fast for us. We can put small cells where we need, because as you've heard, if we are trying to get closer to the customer, you wanna be where you wanna be, not 3,000 feet away. And you need to make sure that that's worked out into a process that everyone can apply towards and work. And um, that's not there today. We've seen spectrum um, across the board, across all the states, we've seen a spectrum of cities that are very, very, very keen on working with us and they're seeing the benefits of what 4G and then quite candidly 5G will bring to the fore and how innovation's gonna be spurred. And then there are other cities that are just not ready. And we've gotta get all of them into a place where uh, we can start moving fairly quickly. Maybe I just to, to, to a point there. I was interesting is if you look at the, the pure construction time of building these networks, that's not where the time is. It's like what you pointed out is getting through the jurisdictions, making them understand what it, you know what we try to do. It's new, um, and you know with all of the smart city, connected city, you know conversations that's out there. You know, you would think that they start seeing the value of connectivity because that's what it's coming down to is how do we connect the residents and, and everything else that they tried to connect, but it seems like, honestly, <laughs> a disconnect there on understanding that what it takes and I need to kind of streamline those processes to be able to do it. So you said 24 months. We have networks we built in three, four months, like in the state of Michigan. Um, and then you have other places like in San Francisco and others where it is a lot more difficult. And you know, that's making it difficult for Verizon and us to, you know, how do you at scale go and be able to do this? You know, an interesting kind of just maybe tidbit is 
you know, we're um, a CLEC and have a lot of franchise agreements with different cities out there to get on the street lamps and, and that. And, you know, the access that we have from a pole infrastructure perspective exceeds 200 million poles. But it's how do you go and actually the process to get the right and, and, and put them on there is what uh, take all the time. Yeah. And, um, and then again, it, they look very similar. So, you know, if it's small cells, you know, that's the reason we call it distributed networks because it doesn't really matter from that perspective if it's a DAS node or a radiohead or, or, or a small cell, they look very similar. And well, sometimes even a jurisdiction get hung up on if it's a small cell versus a, a, a DAS node and then they have different um, regulations. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing I think we as an industry could help them understand that they shouldn't get in the middle of deciding what the technology should be. Just to, uh, to add to your question, uh, or in answer to your question, I should say, is the, uh, the, there's the operational issues when it comes to municipalities. Anything you put outside a building or anything that actually you know, needs to get outside of approval can add a lot of time to it. You know, in building solutions today for small cells, i.e. Ethernet-based solutions, can indeed be actually deployed and installed in a matter of days or weeks at the most. Um, but then you also have the operational aspect of a mobile operator and service provider or even their partners, which is this fast move from a you know, DAS infrastructure, which takes longer time and a lot of project planning, to then swapping that out with something that can be deployed in weeks and months was a shock to the system of many mobile operators. Um, but you know, now I can say, you know, here we are in 2016, things are a lot better, things are running a lot smoother. Uh, I don't see why it would take two years to deploy anything moving forward. You know, especially you know, Verizon has experience and they can roll it out in a matter of you know, right. very and, quick time. And I think we've learned also over the last, small cells are not new for us, right? So over the past few years, we've deployed hundreds of these um, and we've learned what works and what doesn't work. So we are taking a formula to the cities um, along with the likes of Exonets and saying, well, here's what works. Uh, we need access to right of way. We need access to the poles in the right of way, city furniture in the right of way uh, for the just uh, and fair price, which is sustainable. And um, that can be done. And we've seen a lot of cities where if we can get the right kind of shot clocks for permitting um, and zoning can be pre-approved, the design can be pre-approved, you can get clearance for a lot of the neighborhoods that you are gonna go into. This can be done. It's just, um, it becomes daunting when uh, there is the lack of understanding of what exactly we're trying to do and how it's gonna help the consumers and what it is that the city can do to support us. All of that pulled together is really making it. Um, Mary? I, like, I like to make the situation a little bit more complex. We have four <laughs> carriers, and we are carrying, uh, providing capacity and coverage in the same area. So now the question comes in is, you know, you're gonna have four of them in the same spot. So still, I believe that there, is a, there are solutions already available. There might be, the same way that neutral hosts are available within the building as a DAS, there could be possibilities also that there will be outdoor small cell systems that is smart enough to differentiate between the uh, subscriber and being able to divert their data or their communication to the specific location. Because if you look at it, I can give you an example right here in Venetian, everybody, I think Sprint wants to provide coverage, Verizon wants to provide coverage, everybody. So within a DAS system, it seems to be a little bit simpler, but when you go to a small cell and you have uh, the area outside and you're trying to connect this one, then you have a much more complex environment with four carriers to provide uh, the uh, coverage and capacity. But even further than that, the question is that anytime we talk about outdoor coverage, we have been in the position, if I put myself in a carrier position, I would have to go knock somebody's door to open, uh, I would like to put an antenna on your building, or I wanna put an antenna here, and not talking about the right of the way yet, so which is a municipality and regulation and everything. So, and the other part is also that you're looking traditionally, we have several tower companies and everything else, and you have to go through those process, which in itself is very complex. So, the industry needs a, a different process here, and. We, the real estate needs to get commoditized to the carrier instead of carrier going out there and trying you know, to, sell, uh, to talk to them, oh, I wanna put an antenna there, rather they 
real estate consider carrier that I have the property available if you would like to use it. When you do this one, then we truly understand the cost saving of the small cell. Because at the current scenario, when you go there and talk to an owner, they're gonna be asking immediately, regardless of your size of antenna or anything else, $2,000, $5,000. And then it has 3% escalation over a 10 year period, it is huge amount of dollar. At the same time, you look at the current towers, or in the same uh, space that they have been leased, uh, what, 20 years ago? And they have had also 3% escalation. So I think the small cell has a huge impact on the industry, even where the macro coverage is right now there, even further out of the densification process, because the operators have to, they have to drop the cost of the network. And when you look at just the tower cost, fiber cost, and everything else, so the market needs to get commoditized. So there's one thing, though, uh, that I respectfully defer from you, in my opinion, and that's around the use of DAS as the possible solution for small cells externally. Uh, and our partners will know we've used DAS extensively, DAS is extensively across uh, the outdoors as well as indoors, but the choice needs to be with the carrier because, as we were discussing, the technology shouldn't be dictated by the city or the municipality or by FC. Nobody should be, the carrier should be, in control of what they need to be using and where. And if they want to use a CDAN because it makes more sense there for co coordination with macros or for uh, their own cost purposes, that's what they do versus a uh, DAS solution. And I think it's extremely justifiable and doable, and we've worked it with cities like Boston where we can have right of first refusal for other carriers as well, so not one carrier is. We want all the carriers to have similar ways to go support small cells. And no, no, I'm fully in agreement. I, I am fully agreement. That is the current process. That's how we looked at the New York port authorities. We, we did a lot of stuff. We looked at the airports and everything else. I'm in full agreement with that. There is not uh, no issue there. So I, I, I do, I have done that work, actually being involved with it. What I'm looking here is, you know, like that, we're talking about 5G. We are talking the, the convergence. And who thought CD, MA, GSM, all of those uh, amps and everything else, we are gonna end up in LTE now into the 5G. So I'm effectively looking hopefully for the future that things are gonna become a little bit more, less complicated. It, it becomes more convergent in terms of you know, what, how it's gonna happen. Who knows? <laughs> I think that's a wishful thought. Sorry. I, I think it, you know, I think the, it's the, where it starts. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> so. I think it, 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 the, the trick is how do you actually break down that complexity. You know, we, we serve all the carriers, right? Our networks are serving all the carriers and we need to, um, you know, accommodate them because they have a very different business model, right? And spectrum position and technologies they want to deploy. So it, I think, you know, that problem, I don't look at that as a complexity. You know, that's something we've done for a really long we've time. Done it. We've and, 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 and it's not, DAS is not the solution. You know, that's the reason we, for a long time, I talk about this as a distributed network because we look at, it doesn't really matter if it's called a DAS node or a radio head or a, a small cell. It's what we connect on the end of, of the network. And then we have fiber connecting it back. And we might not even have the carriers at the same location. This is part of, yes. you know, the, the, the benefit of what we do. We are not like a tower company that looking at every single site as, you know, everybody need to be on this site. If I have access to, you know, 10,000s or millions of poles, next carrier could be on the pole next, and that's where it might be where their, their users are. Yes. And, um, you know, just give an, an example, um, when we, some of the networks we built in the 07, 08 timeframe was for companies like Metro PCS or Cricket. They had a very different philosophy than Verizon. They were going after a specific segment in the market, and they wanted to make sure that the network was dense right there. But they didn't care as much about the business users or the drive routes. Verizon obviously do. They want to have a network you know, more consistently to areas. But the good news was when we had a fiber grid in that area, we could sort of all of the carriers, and we had access that we was touching you know, literally 10,000s of poles that where we could put, you know, call it a small cell, call it a DAS, no, call it a radio. This didn't really matter. And what that did is we were driving, you know, economy for everybody that way. The time initially was, you know, a little bit longer, but when we already had the network in place, we could go and execute it. That's part of 
you know, refining that mm -hmm. model. The other part that we haven't really talked about is indoor, right? We, we, you talked about, you know, what it takes to get through in a municipality, but our experience dealing with building owners, I think they have a tendency to see the value of that connectivity um, quicker some, to some degree. And we see that change happening right now and getting them as being more of a customer and more contributing to the infrastructure that is necessary to provide service for the carriers and not just sitting back and saying, you know what, I want rent, it, you know what, you need to do it this way, you need to build infrastructure that's dedicated only for this purpose. Um, to, to Ronnie's point, because a lot of these technologies now could leverage, you know, uh, internet, backhaul type, cloud-based um, solutions, it's a lot of different um, type of networks, not only the traditional public cellular networks that could leverage those backbones um, in those buildings specifically. The same apply outdoors from municipality, it's just, it's just a little bit more difficult process to go through. But I think that's where we see a lot of the, the strategies and the ways of getting at this to get to that program mentality and, and, and getting this to be more streamlined rather than every poll, every city being you know, a one-off. Yeah. I couldn't figure out where we disagreed, actually. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have another question there. Yeah, actually, I was uh, getting very excited with this last conversation you were having. Uh, you brought up so many interesting points that I wanted to bring up, uh, and I don't know where to start. Um, so let me, I, wrote, I had to write it down to minimize uh, the topics. So my name is Apkar Dhaliwal. I uh, work for Fluido. Uh, at Fluido, what we do is we virtualize the RAN. We virtualize the RAN so much that we even do layer one call processing in the cloud. So let me ask the panel. So what do you think um, th of the value of of having densification being done not on lampposts, but in a car. As you can imagine, we have millions of cars now, and if you have millions of cars, you don't have to go to the regulator or the local authority to get planning permission, right? So you add the VRAN, you add the, the front hall, and you can do that only if you can tolerate the latency. Yeah. And then if you can add to that mesh a backhaul, well, what do you think of that solution as densifying Networks fast Look, enough. there are lots of solutions out there that are professing mo mobile uh, nodes, and uh, the issue does end up being how you do the tight coordination with everything else out there, because you're not going to just exist in isolation. You're going to be coexisting with the macros, the overlays, and the, the underlays and everything. Uh, that's one point. And then the second point does end up being latency and how much you can afford it. And then thirdly, the back hall, um, or you can call it the front hall if you're looking well, at it as yeah, yeah. Well. yeah, so you have the front hall different from the back hall. And so this, that's where the CRAN comes in. Yeah. So the CRAN, with you, what you mentioned earlier, with a co multi multipoint interference management will take care of all that, right? Yeah, it, it would if you have the right kinds of latencies. I mean, right now, our needs are, and we haven't even seen Cipri over Ethernet as yet, our needs are pure dark fiber to do that level of latency or that low let latency. Once that's resolved, um, it'd be a great solution to have. Just to clarify, so, by the way, congrats on your funding. Um, the, uh, you know, you're talking about really a mobile ad hoc network where the, uh, the, the yep. device, you know, mobile are becoming connecting points. Um, you know, it, it's maybe back to you again from a question, but I mean, you equip a million cars with that type of capability. You also introduced a million points of interference into the network. Um, and that's I'm, where the EI, a comp like solution would work. But that today and for the foreseeable future requires very tight latency requirement that has uh, imposed. And that's one of the reasons why we're going dark fiber <coughs> along with the expense reductions. I, I can just see the RAND people just tearing their hairs out right there. I already did mine, but you know, they're just tearing <laughs> their hairs. But, but I can you know, really see a future. Interesting concept. Also, who pays for the electronics in the car? Yeah. Yeah, as you, you don't Minor detail. Don't, don't forget that the DOT is about to mandate vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety, yeah. right? Yeah. And so how we evolve the 11P DSRC we've been trying to do for years, with that silicon in the car, with the hotspot silicon and the other silicon, we have access to all the silicon, and yeah. 5G is about software, right? 
Can you just imagine putting this on ice cream trucks? All the guys going, yes, there's the ice cream and Wi-Fi, you know. It's a good business model. All right. There we have another question. Um, just a quick question back to the theme of spectrum. Um, millimeter wave frequencies and radiation there, wouldn't that uh, force the networks to be more densified and make that problem even worse in terms of how to deploy it? Oh, absolutely. So and as you start talking about 5G, the characteristics of the millimeter waves, and you're talking uh, the 28 gig, the 37, 39 gigs, right, uh, which uh, FCC has so kindly um, started allocating for 5G, um, all with the help of CTIA, so thank you, CTIA. Um, so th that, uh, th that does impose quite some um, considerations as far as propagation and penetration. So you will not have as much tool in the box as you thought you would if that happens. Right? So, the, well, you can look at it in, t in another way, which is, well, it does mean you need to densify even tighter and the lower and tight starts making uh, a very different sort of a, uh, con it has a different connotation in that sense. But you can take what you have in 4G that you've applied to the places where you've applied the small cells and start densifying there. Um, I think one of us was mentioning 5G is not going to be a complete overhaul or overlay of 4G. You're going to do it where the customer needs are. Uh, for example, for Verizon, the first set of needs we're trying to solve for, uh, solve for it are the enhanced broadband needs for residences and fixed mobile. And if you start thinking about those, uh, we need to just make sure that we've got the small cells closer to those residences, closer to those businesses. And that's one of the main reasons why we're all on the bandwagon of let's make sure that everyone's working together to get the cities and the municipalities and the states ready for it. It's absolutely going to be needed, and you bring up the, a very valid point. The density that you need gets a very different meaning in 5G. So can you elaborate a little bit more about when 5G comes to this uh, whole sure. system? Yeah, and we talked a little bit about it. 5G, again, uh, 4G is bringing a lot, and there's still a lot more we can get with LTE Advance. But staying a ahead of the capacity and the demand that we've got, Verizon, and in conjunction with a whole bunch of other big uh, notables in the technology co community, Verizon's pulled them together into a technology forum. Uh, when we were actually released the first spec for fixed 5G um, specifications, right? So we've started with that. We have the spectrum allocated. We've done a lot of trials, very encouraging trials with the right kinds of MIMO technologies. And we are in pre-commercial stage right now in a lot of, mm -hmm. lots of places. Our intent is to do very focused, closer to the customer, closer to where the solutions are required, kinds of investments initially, learn from those. Of course, over time, we have to solve for that multi-rat kind of a story with 5G. So mobility will start showing up. Uh, but that's coming. And that's coming not in decades. It's coming in the next years. Um, and that excites us. But I cannot reiterate, uh, all of that is going to really hinge on making sure we've got a really good, consistent factory across the board, takes a village, to get these small cells out there. Yeah. And, uh, Ronnie, just how? On, yeah, just to build on what you said, I mean, the, I think the big, big opportunity out there, even though we all focus on, you know, say, consumer market, is when you bring a gig speed, you know, in form of a 5G, type of solution you know, into very, very dense areas, into the enterprises and so forth. Um, you know, actually you know, embracing, just like the service providers already are embracing this move from CapEx to OpEx themselves, you're actually helping the enterprises here too as well because now network as a service becomes a possibility. And that brings along with it all these you know, cloud-based services that you know, Verizon and other service providers are already investing in and their partners as well. Yeah. And Tom, how, how do distributed networks evolve in a 5G environment? Uh, I think you know, that's what more and more will provide a 5G type of experience. So like you said, you need to be closer to where the user is or, 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 or the traffic is to really get those speeds, the latency, be able to connect the number of devices, all that. So you know, what we've been doing for, for years you know, is, is just more of the same. Um, and it's just becoming even more critical um, to be able to bring 
the network there. So for us, like I said earlier, I started with kind of the coverage capacity, now it's the functionality piece as well. How do you start putting some of that functionality also closer to the edge of the network so you could treat, you know, a, a uh, you know, somebody going to, to Facebook differently than a doctor that tried to get access to, you know, um, critical medical information, or if it is, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, driverless cars, stuff like that, they have different uh, uses. So, you know, the, the general architecture. If only there wouldn't be the, net, uh, the FCC with net neutrality. Excuse, excuse me? If only there wouldn't it, it, be the FCC with net neutrality yeah. that prevents you from treating them differently. Yeah. Well, it, that's not necessarily true, though. I mean, when it yeah. comes to, say, an enterprise or hospital and so forth, they have the ability to prioritize this communication. On a private network. On, private. So. On a private network. That, that, yeah. That's the reason or I even think a it, private hosted network, you know, by Verizon, for instance. And, and that's where we see some of the, you know, I think some of the opportunity from a business perspective, how, you know, Verizon will make more money, right? Because you will have a different way of, of looking at, like you mentioned, the, the, the value of the network and, and how that provided um, not only as a subscription on a phone, right? Um, I think that's where you get these small networks. Now you also create new opportunities um, to, to provide uh, more differentiated services. So it's all kind of in that same realm. Um, so obviously we're very excited about that and, and you know, we have you know, built skills and, and, and abilities to do it, but we also know that there will be a lot more coming and, and you know, um, and working together with the entire ecosystem to understand that and, and bring that to, uh, to, to the market. And Ronnie, how do you think unlicensed networks will come into this? It's uh, kind of full circle where we started in the, in the beginning here. I mean, it, you know, whether it's licensed or unlicensed bands, whether it's, you know, 3.5 LTE or it's, you know, 2.458 Wi-Fi, um, you know, and all the other, you know, licensed bands, it's all going to have to work together. I mean, it's, it's no longer about, you know, which spectrum, which technology. It's all of the above. You need all of the above to make this work. And I was thinking about your question. The gentleman in the front there was asking about, you know, the train. Uh, your solution is probably the combination of, you know, macro, cellular, you know, base station, picocells, tossing some Wi-Fi on the train, you know, you should be set. I wouldn't want to be the project manager for that, but yeah. <laughs> best of luck. Uh, it all has to just work together. You need all of the above. Right. And Barry, how do, how do small cells then evolve with 5G? I think a small cell is, naturally we could say it is going to be in the... For, with, uh, with the 5G. Uh, there will be a deployment of a small cell in different bands, but I think uh, it remains to be seen, but majority is gonna go into the 5G because uh, they, they are targeted. Uh, as Prado mentioned, you know, currently there are uh, no mobility, but uh, it's coming in two years, there will be mobility. Um, so, uh, the, the key part of the small cell uh, 5G or 4G is, is it targeting what you intend to target? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for a few more questions before we, uh, because we're almost up with the hour. So if you have any more questions. Otherwise, I want to thank the panel. Really appreciate it, and I want to thank the audience for, for participating. Thank you very much thank for you. a very good day.